Okay, shall we get started? I think uh, we've got quite we've got thirty one people in the room. I think we're we're ready to go. What do you say? Okay, Kate? Kate? Yep, let's go. Okay. Well, um, well, I, I'll start if you like, Alistair. Mm -hmm. uh, welcome. <laughs> um, as you've been reading about, um, this topic is on openness and sharing. And Alistair and I had put together the video tutorial for you, introducing some of the ideas and topics. And then there's been some fantastic action on the Padlet where lots of interesting discussions have been um, taking place and questions and prompts. And so tonight, Alistair and I are going to uh, be looking at a little bit deeper at some of those topics that you've raised and discussing some of those uh, and getting some input hopefully from you guys as well. Um, I, as I've been saying earlier, I'm here in Brisbane, Australia. I'm home uh, right now because it's 5.37 in the evening. And, um, yeah, I, I'm coming to you from the end of your day that you're just beginning for a lot of you. Um, you're going to have a great one. It's going to be a great day. Um, so that's the advice from the future. Um, yep. At the moment, I'm a full-time PhD student uh, and looking at uh, how teachers learn using professional and personal learning networks online. So this all fits very well into that area of study and research. Um, I'm also doing a bit of part-time teaching, juggling lots of different roles. And I've been thrilled to be part of ONL. I participated for the first time at the beginning of last year, and then I was a co-facilitator for the last two iterations, and this semester, uh, this semester working with Alistair to present this topic with him. So I'll hand over to Alistair, he can quickly introduce himself. Yep, I think I've been seen and heard quite enough so far. Um, <laughs> Alistair Creelman, Linnaeus University, Kalmar, South East Sweden. Uh, welcome to this webinar. Uh, it's uh, it's great being able to do this. Sort of, I mean, the wonderful thing about ONL is it open up opens up new partnerships and uh, cooperation possibilities, and just the fact that Kay and I are able to collaborate so closely, uh, face to face from either side of the world is just it's pretty mind-blowing and it, it's great that i sort of so i sit talking to Kay and discussing things and so on and then i wander into the coffee room next door and uh, have coffee with my colleagues and sort of oh just just talking to somebody in australia oh <laughs> you know it's 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 the sort of thing that uh, many of us do all the time but for other people it's quite amazing that uh, it's quite an amazing occurrence anyway just before we keep up one last time i'm going to say the same thing i've said several times uh, down on the bottom, move your cursor down to the bottom. You can find a menu row there. Far left, you can unmute your microphone if you want to speak. There's a video button to activate your video camera. Many of you have. It's up to you. Then further along in the middle, you can activate the participant button so you can see all the people who are in this meeting. And you can also please everybody press, press the chat button uh, because then you can see the chat because if you don't press the chat button, you've no idea there's a chat there. And that's where we want you to put a lot of your ideas. So this is being recorded. The recording will be put, uh, maybe it'll take a little while because Kay's got to go to bed soon before too long. <laughs> uh, so maybe probably tomorrow yes. or the middle of the night our time, yes. Kay, we'll, we'll get a link there. But it'll be out tomorrow. Yes. Okay. So Let's go. We're going to do first, and, and this is, um, as we were discussing, we're using Zoom, um, which is a little different to the usual webinar tool Adobe um, um, that we is used. So we're being a little bit experimental here. We're going to ask you, I'm going to share my screen, and uh, let's just see that I can share the screen with you. So now you should be able to see a large, white screen and it says at the very top go to www.menti.com and use the code 723939 now what we're going to do is we're going to invite you uh, if you have um, a phone or a tablet or if you can uh, have several if you have two screens or you want to minimize this screen to go to this website www.menti.com and on this, it's a, um, it's a little quiz tool that we've been uh, experimenting with. When you enter the code 723939, 
it should prompt you to enter in three words that you feel best describe openness in education. And as you enter those words, fingers crossed, we should see them appearing on the screen in a word cloud. So we have one word, transparency. Fantastic. So we know that it's Loads working. of words, please. Every At know, least three yeah. words that you can think of. Feel free to add more if you would like. And let's get an idea of where we're all sitting with our understanding of what we think openness is. Because the thing about openness is that it is very flexible and it has many different interpretations. It's not about having a correct answer or a correct word. It depends very much on your personal experience. We're getting a few more now. We've got freedom, news, growth, collaboration, exponential. Oh, I like that one. Reliable. Issues of reliability do come to the fore. Global. So you should be seeing the word cloud growing. They, yep, it's, it's looking beautiful. And don't restrict yourself just to the hallelujah chorus. Uh, if there are negative issues here, then put them in. We can see availability, unreliable. That is, it's, it can be a little unreliable because there are less checks and balances mm -hmm. in some ways. Voices, it, that's a great one because I think it allows us to hear voices that perhaps we are, haven't been able to hear in the past. And the concept of a filter bubble is very interesting as well. Does it help us break out of a filter bubble? Or does it content, uh, you know, lead, lead us in towards our own little filter bubbles? Democratic? I think we can see from the size of sharing that that is a common theme. Um, in the cloud, the larger the word, the more men it is, the more times people have entered it. So transparency and flexible are up there with commonality. It does involve taking risks, you're right. And it does enable variation. I'm just tilting my head to read the words that are vertical. Online courses can form part of open learning, absolutely. And I think that the technology that we have today is what oh, I think open education and open an open approach to things has always existed in some form or another, but that the technology that we have today is has accelerated the growth and the interest in openness. So we've got um, including, so it, the, that idea of inclusion and generous. That's an interesting one because it does require us to be generous, generous with our time, generous with our, with our content, with our talents and our skills, sharing them with other people in a generous way. The concept of whether or not it's ethical and how we uh, guarantee eth um, the ethics is uh, you know something you could talk about all day and all night. Informal, not formally recognised. That's an interesting one because are we going to see in the future, you know, an increase in the formal recognition of openly shared materials? We already see open um, open journals being accepted in perhaps a, a more increased way. Are we going to see this increase even more? So that tool sort of worked pretty well. We've got one more question to ask you to gather your thoughts and feelings on. And we thought that we would group these together at the first start of the uh, webinar because Rather than having people juggling multiple tools and putting them down and then coming back to them, we thought if we group them both together. So if I go to the next slide, the next question is, how open are you? Now, when we put this slide together, we were talking about lots of different in, uh, ideas about what openness means. 
and how openness can be seen and made evident in our attitudes, in what we think and how we approach things, but it can also be evident in our practice. And they don't necessarily need to be the same. And it doesn't necessarily need to be that closed is bad and open is good. We don't need to see necessarily, uh, we're not saying that openness is the answer to everything and that everything should always be open. As we concluded in the tutorial, um, you know, having an awareness of what openness is and open pedagogy and open education and all of the things that go with openness can that let us be more informed so that we can make decisions about times when we feel it is more appropriate to be closed. There are many reasons why we might need to be more closed in our, in our practice sometimes. There are issues of vulnerability and of confidence. Um, there are, there are um, times when we need to be more closed because uh, of you know, uh, business secrets and, and uh, copyright or intellectual property. I'm just going to type my email address into the chat because someone's having difficulty getting in. Yeah, I went in and re-edited the, uh, the web page <clears throat> and uh, the link, I don't know what was wrong. It seemed to be the right link, but it wasn't activating for some reason. So we're seeing that overall we've got a higher, more of a, of a leaning towards open with attitudes and slightly less, but still quite open in our practice, which is interesting. I thought there would be more of a gap, to be honest. I think that um, the idea that you're here participating in the open network course is an example already of your interest and willingness to consider sometimes sharing and being open in your practices and in your ways of approaching things. Um, but like I was saying, sometimes we need to vary our practices between open and closed. It's not a, it's a continuum rather than an, um, a beginning and an end. It's, uh, we jump all over the place, depending upon our context, depending upon what we're doing, depending upon our students, depending upon our own learning needs. Alistair, did you have anything to say about the results that we've got so far? Oh, fairly expected, I think. I think we all, uh, we all want to be open and it's, it sounds very wonderful and it, it's sort of, it's, it's hard to say I'm against openness. Uh, it's like sort of, you know, who's against openness? Uh, but at the same time, if we really look at our practice, uh, maybe we're not as open as we could be. And also there's a very strong case that in, in, for some of you, you simply cannot be completely open. There was a lovely uh, blog post uh, that I saw on the main site uh, yesterday about how in certain fields of study, uh, openness is really almost impossible because if you open up, it's, it, you're studying such sensitive issues and being completely open about them is, can, can be a security risk, can risk compromising people's identities. Uh, and also it's such a sensitive issue that there's a, there's a great danger today of being exposed to trolls and the uh, people who are yeah the the sort of rather nasty people that are out there in the world so that uh, we can't be totally open and that's not what we're trying to say in this unit uh, openness is a sliding scale uh, and it has to you have to judge uh, how open you should be in certain contexts we may return to that later in the webinar. Sorry, everybody, about links not working. I had no idea that was the way. There were two links on that page, uh, but uh, and one of them worked and the other one didn't seem to. But as far as I can see, they both work now. Uh, <clears throat> well, I'm going to stop sharing the screen and hand over to Alistair so that he can yep. share the Padlet. At the same time, are there anyone would like to unmute the release their microphone button or raise your hand if you would like to say something or comment on this. You raise your hand over in the participant menu on the on the right, I think. And you unblock your microphone down at the bottom, I think but different devices show this screen in different ways and I'm pointing in the direction I can see it. Yes, Anna, your chat 
um, post has worked, yes. <laughs> Okay, nobody wanting to say, make any comments? Don't be shy. Otherwise, I will share my screen, just a second. We were very pleased uh, to see the enormous discussion that has gone on on the Padlet page. If you haven't been there, well, you know, if you haven't been there, you won't be here. But uh, <laughs> if you haven't taken part in the discussion, then please do. This can go on and on. And uh, don't worry about space because uh, the page can go on in infinity down to the bottom. So just double click somewhere and put in more comments. This is our discussion. And I think there's a lot of information, a lot of ideas that will help your topic work about the scenarios. So please have a look at this. There's our tutorial video and the questions we asked. We've sort of, we'd like to sort of comment a bit on some of these questions. And we'd also like to have uh, some of you who asked some of these questions or some of these points, please contribute either in the chat, but it's really nice to hear you. And if you, yeah, I think it's fairly clear that you go down you unlock your microphone and and speak. But uh, Kay, we had uh, we had some we had identified some areas to look at. We certainly did. Um, one of the things that we felt were coming through the posts was the idea of um, how open openness and open practice only uh, can only really happen when there's a culture within the institution or within the group of people of you know, everyone is thinking about things in, in a similar way in terms of um, being being open to being open, basically. Um, it, it's without that culture and without that, that sense of trust and uh, without that sense of, um, the, of um, desiring to be uh, reciprocal with our sharing, that um, being open just doesn't necessarily work because it's no good if only one person is always giving and other people are always taking. It needs to be a cycle and a cyclical you know, um, process. So in response to, to that idea of, of having a culture of openness, I, I shared a um, blog post um, just on, on my thoughts about this and how it's almost referring to the soft side of open education because when we're considering uh, open pedagogy, particularly, we're thinking about things like sharing, generosity, trust, and vulnerability. Um, it, although there is definitely a part of open pedagogy and open education is about talking about quality pedagogical technique and certain levels of digital capacity to share across different tools and to take advantage of the affordances of social media and social sharing tools, um, it is really also that sense of of the um, the emotional and the and the um, the ad attitudinal and the dispositional uh, approach that we take towards it that makes it work. In my blog post, I've taken perspectives of both the educator and the student. So when we're talking about the educator, oftentimes to practice openly, the educator has to put aside those traditional notions of a hierarchy of the teacher being at the front of the classroom or higher than the student and the student being the learner um, waiting, waiting to receive the information. They, an educator does definitely make themselves vulnerable when they start practicing openly because they're making themselves vulnerable to their students and to their colleagues. They're opening themselves up to critique. They're putting their work out much more publicly and they're making, uh, giving others the opportunity to really consider and involve themselves <coughs> in that work. Uh, and that can, that's a risk. So, you know, we're, we're taking a risk there. It's also very uh, generosity in spirit in making your life's work freely accessible and making that, uh, that idea of making um, and trusting that other people will make use of it in the same spirit that you shared it and will reciprocate with their own, you know, knowledge and, and resources and not take advantage of the people who are sharing and giving by just taking and taking 
or taking, reusing and not giving credit in the right way. So there's definitely for the educator risks and without that culture of support and that culture of generosity, uh, you know, it, it can it can be too difficult, it can be too too much to ask to, for a, a teacher or an educator to to start practicing publicly and sharing like that. From the side of the student, uh, it also requires um, a, a culture amongst the students and a culture and an approach within their own um, within their own thinking. The student has to put aside that idea that they're an empty vessel and that they're just waiting to be filled with the knowledge and it's all going to come down to them and they don't actually have to do much construction themselves, that they're not creating and participating actively, that somehow the teacher is going to just pass on the knowledge and they'll absorb it. They have to put that aside. And that's something that can be difficult to do when you, especially if you've finished you know, 12 years of schooling and then university where that has been your role. You sit down, you listen, you take in as much as you can and you don't dare to contribute or to think of yourself as an equal. Um, so so for, a t for a student, it can equally be, um, be make themselves feel vulnerable. Um, they are also being generous in their sharing their learning process and putting themselves out there. This is why we talk about it being a sliding scale and that it is not always appropriate to, to, be, um, to be completely open all of the time for the reasons that Alastair was saying, that we, we can have a culture of openness, but that doesn't mean that we never close the doors and never close the windows and that we have just throw everything out there and, and let the cards fall as they may. So having a culture of openness is, you know, it is, it is quite a big step, but it's something that we, we need to have if we want to be aware of this sliding scale and practice in it. Yes, Alastair. Uh, I'd like to bring, <coughs> Kiki was making a comment here about uh, teachers finding it scary. Could you, could you open your microphone, please, Kiki? Down at the bottom. You're a long way from, don't, your headset is not, your headset microphone isn't working. I think it's your uh, inbuilt microphone and you're very far from it. Okay, okay, so if I can change. Is it better? Much better. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, I don't know why it doesn't work. It usually works. But anyway, I think, uh, Many teachers find this scary because it, if they say something which is really maybe not, which was correct two years ago from the evidence-based whatever they were teaching, uh, and two years later a lot of things have changed and, and what they did on this forum or whatever, they, they cannot take it away. They cannot sort of um, say that, well, now I understand this better or in a different way. So. The, the, the lecture that they are giving on on the web in an open area will always be there as a sort of reminder of their mistakes in a way. <laughs> I think you can you can actually delete. Um, it is yeah. possible. You can you can take something off YouTube. You can take some. You can get rid of it. Uh, yeah. But also, it's a, it's also part of our source criticism because if you read an article that was written four years ago or 10 years ago, you've got to see it through that lens that uh, it's 10 years old, things have yeah, changed, yeah. that's not yeah, relevant yeah. anymore. So, I mean, we write articles and we write, uh, a lot of our writing become, sometimes our research articles get published and the world has changed so radically in the three years since we wrote it that, because uh, sometimes the delay is so long that yeah. it's, it's irrelevant when it finally gets published. Yeah. So I mean yeah, that's, that's that happens, but I, it's it's understandable. But I think we need to also be aware of how to how to how to delete stuff. Maybe we yeah. should have uh, systems. There are systems in some open repositories where you have a sort of best before date. Yeah. Uh, many repositories you can actually put down that uh, this is valid for two years, and after two yeah. years it will go up in smoke, uh, and uh, or you get an alert. Uh, I know that we're thinking of that at our university because we're, we're drowning in videos that we're storing in expensive storage space and we're going to go out to uh, teachers and say, look, you've got X number of videos um, mm. that are over five years old. Unless you 
save them yourself, they will be erased in six months' time or something like that. You know, we have to sort of do a bit of, uh, we have to do a bit of uh, cleaning. Yeah. I think we also... I think also that um, uh, I was just reading what Fran was saying about once it's been shared and it spreads, it can be difficult to erase all instances. And I, I totally agree. But I think sometimes that the uh, most powerful learning uh, can be when the teacher or the um, expert um, says, that was where I was. And hey, look, I was wrong. <laughs> and, yeah. Or I've learned more and I've moved on from there. Or, you know, that was the best that we knew at the time and look at how it's developed. And mm. sometimes those blog posts where someone has either added an addendum or they've gone in and crossed out what they, what they had and they've added in sections in that original post. Sometimes I think I learn more from that and I, and I have more respect for the, the teacher or the, uh, the expert because they're saying, you know what? We're all human and we're all learning all the time. And especially now with everything changing just so quickly, anyone who thinks that what was said today is going to stand without question tomorrow has got a bit of a flawed view, I think. So I totally understand that it can be, you know, frightening and risky and that there might be situations where we do have to be closed, where that information may be dangerous. If it was, I mean, I'm, I come from an educational library background, so I don't know much about science and medicine, but I imagine that there'd be some things that if you let loose and other people read them as the truth five years later, that could be quite dangerous. Um, mm. But, you know, I think that in fields where, where the developmental, you know, process is able to be opened up, it actually adds to the learning opportunities. Mm. I think I think it has also to do, I mean, it's one thing, everybody knows what you said, Alistair, that there is... An article that could be five years old and everybody accepts that okay that's old and that's the way but the different thing is really when you show yourself and your face and you say things it becomes like more personal mm. really mm. me yeah. make this mistake and I, I argue for something which is really stupid today <laughs> and I think that is sort of the self image uh, that people are afraid of you know mm. Uh, that's why it's image. personal as well isn't it it is yeah. personal because it we're taking a personal it. risk yeah with our identity as we know we we have an identity of the certain level of expertise or the certain level that people are expecting of us yeah absolutely that's why some people actually may maybe take away a little bit of the the cult of the teacher um, because we're yeah. expected to be yeah. upfront and very often yeah. teaching videos are talking heads uh, mm -hmm. If you took the talking head away and you had a voice and it doesn't really, then you're, you're not so much sort of, you know, we, we put such a personality into teaching. It's yeah. so dependent on one person. Look, this is me and I'm teaching you. And if my mm -hmm. face is not vil visible, I can still teach very effectively. It's the message that's important or mm -hmm. later on not so important. And you are not, you're just delivering or you're, mm -hmm. you know, you can, you can design resources that are there that don't have to present you as the star. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes we fall into this idea of the, the teacher as performer and yeah. uh, that we have to be upfront and we have to be visible at all times. I think sometimes, you know, the typical recorded PowerPoint with a talking head in the corner, does that do anything really? I mean, no. once they've seen a picture of me, even then, who cares? Um, it's not that important. And so then you're not tied to it with that sort of emotional value, maybe. No. No. Fran has... Um, Yep. Raise his hand. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Good, great. Uh, but Alistair, I have a comment there. Uh, the teacher or the talking head may add credibility to the message. So we are not as receptive to messages depending on who is delivering them. So sometimes there's a value on having that talking head in there. It could be, but uh, you could, I mean, it could be very clear on the, uh, the credits who is delivering this, but then um, that's... The, the then you're that, exposed again. Yeah, you're exposed again, but maybe not as the, as the talking head. I mean, I think sometimes what's wrong is that the, the head just stays there all the time. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, then the sort of what is the focus here? I think it's more the, the message and the, uh, the, the use of visuals and so on that is much more effective for learning than having a, a particular person there. Mm -hmm. But I mean, there are, there are so many aspects to this. 
Mm. Yeah, I would. I would just just wanted to add that I think uh, it's it's a matter. It's a bit of a philosophical question that when you become a teacher and you you decide actively to become transparent in this way, uh, as as when you do when you publish papers and stuff, you you're aware of these risks and you're willing to take them and you're willing to rectify if you need to or to evolve. Uh, so it's it's a matter of you know. Uh, we are all in the same boat. We are all uh, kind of fighting for the same goal, which is to teach and to spread the knowledge. And we have to accept that this will happen eventually. Yeah. And Anna, they're delivering a message contains body language. Yes, if you've got that body language and you're <laughs> sort of, you know, doing all this. But I mean, if, it, if it's just a sort of expressionless face and the only thing that's moving are the lips, then there's not a lot going on. But I agree, it can be important I feel all i meant was that to take away a little bit of that personality cult that there is around a teacher as the performer i feel that that uh, idea of connectivism is coming into play a lot as well these days with um the changing role of the teacher because it used to be that the teacher was the source of knowledge was the source of information um you know was the one who held all of the knowledge uh, nowadays, it is either a case that there's too much knowledge, that not, it's just not physically possible for one person to have everything in their head about, you know, something, a particular topic, or alternatively, that the information is just changing so quickly that um, it, it, it is better when we all work together to build our knowledge collaboratively. That the teaching role is turning uh, less uh, as a, a knowledge holder and more as a, a lead, a guide, a facilitator, a meddler in the middle, I've heard some people describe it as, um, that the knowledge and the, and the content and the information sits outside and that we now have different processes and different pedagogies that we need to start thinking about. Um, which, you know, lends itself to that transparency and to that idea that we're, we're all learning together. We might be at different points on the journey. We might be in different points in the network, but that everyone is in a process of learning and developing and changing. And the minute you stop learning, the minute you think, mm. that's it, I know my topic, I know my subject, I need never do another thing about it in terms of putting more new knowledge in my head, that's the day you die. Claude. <laughs> mm. Cloda, do you want to, have you got your microphone? If you could. I think this thing about body language you're mentioning, I mean, <clears throat> mm. again, it depends. If you're looking at, I would say that a large class of like 100 students in a classroom is very similar to a distance online course because I can't see the body language. I can't look into their eyes. I mean, it's just a sea of faces. I have no, I, I can't tell one from the other really. Uh, I might have a dialogue with two or three in a, a lecture time, but uh, I don't really have serious contact with a whole lot of them. And uh, I, don't, I, mean, I can't respond to all these people. I think you can have a lot of, you can have a lot of response in this sort of medium because when we, if this is a lot of people in this room, but if there are only maybe like in your PBL groups, I think we can see each other very clearly. We can gesticulate, we can see, I can see some of you looking a little doubtful. Maybe you're multitasking, maybe, you know, you who are brave to put your cameras on, you know, I can, I can, I, yeah, I can see you're sort of listening to some things, other things you're not so sure. I mean, it depends how many people you have in front of you. Um, but and it, the teacher I'm has not, the feedback. Sure you can, yeah. They can feed from it as well. And, and it, I do agree that it can be um, more challenging because I know that whenever I'm speaking, even now, I'm looking for the smilers and the nodders. I'm, <laughs> when people are thinking, sometimes their thinking face looks a little, you know, cranky. It's a little bit, hmm, I'm thinking hard. And instantly I'm thinking, oh, they don't like what I'm saying. So it, it definitely is important. Um, and, and I think that we're, as technology changes and as we evolve, we're going, to, we're going to learn different ways of communicating, hopefully, to express some of that uh, a little more clearly. And I think we can use different media for expression because I think online learning has been far too much text-based. I think now you can record uh, 
quick videos on your mobile and upload them to a platform, asynchronous discussions. You have so many new opportunities there and you can see each other and you can hear each other. You can provide personal feedback and so on. But it's not a matter of a contest of what's better on site or online. It's not a, it's not a battle. It's, it's putting together the right mix. I'd like to move a little bit into the field of uh, another field that came up on the Padlet page and that was about so a lot of people were worried about credentials and about uh, verification of identity. Um, there's a lot of work going on here. I think when it comes to things like MOOCs, it's, it's work in progress. Don't believe that a MOOC is a defined object and you can say a MOOC is this, a MOOC is that doesn't work. It's a great scale. There are MOOCs that are very collaborative. The very first MOOCs were extremely collaborative. Uh, many MOOCs, this is in basically a MOOC, it's just not so massive. But I mean, why are we stuck with this massive idea? The whole thing is an experiment in how can you scale te le learning? How can you scale education? Uh, you can't scale education on site, it gets completely impossible. Once you get above about 200, uh, a campus course falls apart really, because uh, once you get above 200, you need virtually a, you know, a basketball arena or a football stadium to gather them all together. Whereas online, you can scale it up. But what happens when you scale it up? What do you lose? What do you gain? What's possible? What's not possible? And the whole MOOC thing is examining these. There's no answers. The, the, you know, we haven't got the fine. There's no final answer. There's no sort of this is a MOOC. So I mean, it, it's developing all the time. Basically, a MOOC is a course that you have scaled up and opened up to a certain extent. And if you want to put examination onto the end of it, there are many universities who say, if you want to get credits for this, you have to come to our university or another university and you can sit an examination under examination forms with identity control and we will judge that. And if you pass it, you'll get real university credits. And that's happening. And that is traditional examination. Uh, there are others who are using various web tools for uh, there's several web tools that offer secure examination online and these are almost creepy in a way because there are great big call center companies in the USA who specialize in this and they're doing it for many universities where your web they act, you've got your web camera in your room uh, the software logs everything you do on your computer everything you look at is logged there are alerts that come up if anything looks suspicious and the call, they will go in and check you. Uh, before you start the exam, you have to show the examiner uh, what's behind. Uh, can we have a look over here? What have you got? Can you see, have you got, what's that? What's that? Take that away. Uh, what have you got here? And they will monitor the sound and the video all the time. And they claim that it is as reliable as a normal examination hall. Though, of course, you know that it's not reliable because people cheat there as well. It's very, it's a cat and mouse game. Maybe we need to have different forms of examination, but there are ways of providing real credentials for so-called MOOCs. Then there are also new types of credentials, things like nano degrees, micro masters, which are not pretending to be university qualifications. They are not the same, they are different. But again, if employers say, we accept that, we think that's valid, then it is. And we can scream and dance and shout as much as we like, but if the employers accept it, there you are. And there's Zarina has done a, you've done a, a written assignment based on field work. Could you explain that a little, Zarina? Have you got your microphone? If you just this, really... uh, this was in public health um, yeah. and uh, so the, I, I did it about two, three years ago uh, and this was in relation to, uh, we, were, we were supposed to go out and interview health professionals 
and write a, a report based on a, a certain set of criteria that was given to us uh, according to a guideline. And then that was, it. it's like any other written assignment, even on a campus course that we would ask them to hand in a written paper. And that is the part of the examination. And some yeah. people could choose not to do it and not get the sort of the certificate. Mm. And then it was, you ran it through an anti-plagiarism control as well, I, um, I imagine. Yes, or it would yes, be, um, yes. I think, so it's up um, to the universities. I think one thing that I've, I've heard of is um, that, may, that may, is um, an effective way of um, ensuring that um, we re reimagine how we assess is by coming up with ungoogleable questions. So having responses uh, required of students, and this would apply for a MOOC as well, where um, it, it's not possible to just Google for the answer, um, whether or not uh, the student has to construct something original or whether or not they have to, um, they have to rework or reimagine what already exists. Um, that avoids that idea of, of plagiarism. Arizona State University, uh, they have an interesting uh, idea that they're, they've been trying for a couple of years now. The idea in, in the US, of course, it costs a fortune to go to university. Uh, you, get, uh, in, you have to take enormous loans and uh, it's crippling for many people. So saving one year of campus time means, can mean the difference between going to university and not. So what ASU do is they have a program for many of their first year programs. They have a MOOC option or let's say an open education option. You go a set number or you take your courses as online, open online courses in there. They have a selection of those courses. You take them. You are supervised. Uh, they have people who supervise. There is much more close supervision of that. They, you get linked up with, uh, sometimes it's, it can be postdocs or, or doctoral students who are helping, who are sort of mentors for you. Uh, you have an examination at the end of each course where you have to go to a certified examination center, not necessarily the university itself, but another university. And if you pass all of these courses, you are then automatically accepted for year two and year two, you have to go to ASU. Uh, but you've managed to do your first year at a fraction of the cost of actually being on campus. And for many people, that is an opportunity. No matter how much we love our campus time at university, it's just not possible for many people in the world. And uh, this is a way of helping people into the system that otherwise wouldn't have a chance. And maybe universities are beginning to do that sort of thing. There's also a lot of universities who are offering <clears throat> letting students, uh, we've got some examples at my university, we're letting students go on a MOOC at another university to do a course that we don't offer but we will examine it so that by going on the MOOC with another university, then we examine uh, what they've done on that MOOC and give them credits at our university for it. So that you can go a course at somewhere else and you get international experience uh, by going on that course. So maybe we could be, we could open up for internationalization for our students by letting our students take part in open courses at other universities and then we could agree with that other university about how we're going to examine it and then be able to give uh, credentials for that. There are many, many opportunities, a lot of this is going on, it's very, very uh, active and actually Europe is way ahead of the USA in terms of MOOCs now. There's a new report, I think I put a link on, that's come out only a few weeks ago that shows clearly that MOOC development and MOOC innovation is rolling in Europe, but has sort of come to a standstill in the US. Uh, Europe, uh, there are now MOOCs in many, most of the European languages, and they're also on platforms that are not the big consortia. So European universities are taking control of this phenomenon and using it as part of their development. And this is, uh, you know, a lot of major serious universities in Europe are doing this. And so it's stopping, it's going from MOOC to, business, to, to part of the 
higher education system. Mm. I think also that there are benefits of MOOCs that may not necessarily uh, be part of the um, accreditation, but that um, are a bonus that you wouldn't normally get any other way. So, for example, at, at the moment, I'm studying formally through Queensland University of Technology for my PhD. Um, it's um, very much based in Brisbane. I work at home here in Brisbane and I go to uni in Brisbane, but at the same time, I've been able to participate in ONL as a participant, as a co-facilitator. I've learnt so much in uh, uh, not only content um, that you know complements what my research is focusing on, but also culturally. I have learnt and I've been able to develop my skills in, in online pedagogy, in connecting with and communicating with people from all over the world, in working in small groups and co-facilitating small groups where people have come from Pakistan and Poland and Finland and all sorts of places that I have never been to that are just so, so far away um, and that are so uh, different culturally from Australia. And that's not something that is going, that's only going to enhance my capacity when I graduate uh, from my PhD. Um, I'm, you know, I can, I can include it in my, in my uh, CV that I have been participating, the roles, the descriptions of what I've done and what I've learned. Okay, I don't have a formal qualification as a result of it, but there's been so many benefits that have, you know, I've been able to accrue. Um, and basically, the only cost has been my own time, my internet connection. So, you know, because I know that if this was a course that I had to pay for, um, being a full-time PhD student on a scholarship, it would be out of the question. So, you know, this is, these are some of the things that I think make open learning and, and MOOCs so exciting for learning in general. Time is galloping along here. Yeah. Um, a little bit here. Let me see. Uh, some more. I some more questions. It's uh, we have. Uh, I'll just paste the uh, the link to the. Uh, I put a link not to my own university because there's no evidence of that. It's uh, an experiment. But uh, the Arizona State University Global Freshman Academy concept, I've just put a link on there. The other thing I think is the, um, the resources that are created as a, as a result of interacting with open learning. For example, um, about four years ago, I participated in um, an online course um, it was a free online course and it was operated out of the University of Edinburgh who do uh, quite a few MOOCs and online offerings. Um, and one of the tasks in the MOOC was to um, portray, uh, create a digital object that portrayed how you understood the learning to be happening and how you understood, how you perceived the learning in the course to be happening. To do this task, I created an interactive image and it was basically like of an old time schoolhouse uh, but I put in all of the new digital tools and things that I was using so we had the YouTube we had the the platform we were communicating on we had the online repository of open resources all of those sorts of things now about a year after that MOOC had been run I was contacted by um, one of the uh, academics that was running the MOOC and he was asking if I wouldn't mind if that an image of that and a description of that um, interactive uh, representation was included in his book about um, online learning. Now, that resource that I had created was then used as, as, as a roll-on in a, in a formally published and closed uh, book um, uh, that was furthering the learning of other people. So I think it all feeds into each other and no learning or no opportunities for creation of knowledge is ever wasted. Um, and that this is opening up the MOOC isn't necessarily um, going to ever and it won't and we shouldn't want it to replace institutionalized learning or universities, but that it's opening up more avenues for, you know, connection and for learning and construction of resources and knowledge that didn't exist before. Just reading. Yeah, reading the two them. types of MOOCs. Yes. Any any more com some comments vocally? Um, 
anyone want to it's so easy to easy for us to talk <laughs> too easy yes as i've written there from from fran i think the we're we're seeing MOOCs are just breaking into not breaking up, but they're they're turn they're going in different directions. There are very commercial directions, um, very much the so Silicon Valley dominated, and very much quick fix and uh, glittery and uh, um, flashy and very expensive. But there is an awful lot of really good stuff going on, which the universities are completely in control of, and that's not so upfront. It's not so visible, but uh, I think the real openness is going on under the surface. One problem with all this is it is a fact that those who need open education most don't know it's there. I very often ask students, how many of you have heard of MOOCs? Virtually none of them. They've never heard of it. They don't know it, it exists. They've never heard of open education either. They didn't know it exists. Uh, and they are the ones who, in a way, we think know all these things, but very many don't know about it. And that's even worse if you go to the people who are not in higher education. And all the surveys show that uh, the people who take MOOCs are people like us. The people who already know how to study. We can do it ourselves. We're all digitally literate. And we go there just to get more. The people who really need that open education need help. And that's why I think we need to provide support. There are many cases, there is a, there's a phenomenon called MOOC meetings or MOOC meetups uh, all over the world where people who are studying MOOCs get together and talk about the whole idea of online studies in their own language. They may be studying MOOCs in English, but they all get together and teach each other and help each other in their own language. That can be facilitated by local libraries. That can be facilitated by learning centers, community centers. That's happening a lot now. You need somebody to hold your hand. You need somebody to show you how to do it. Someone who's in the same position and can say, oh, I know how to fix this. Uh, don't worry. That's what normally happens. But if you're totally on your own, the minute something goes wrong, you think, I knew it. I'm too stupid for higher education. I'm out. And that's what happens again and again. I think many of the dropouts in online learning are because they don't understand what we're talking about. They don't understand the academic jargon. They don't understand how to learn online and the minute they meet a problem that just confirms their own suspicion that they're too stupid for this sort of thing and uh, I think we lose a lot of good people that way by not providing enough support not providing scaffolding that um, leads Alistair to that image that I was um, sharing with you yesterday I can share that now if you like mm -hmm. as we um, finally I'll we just, come to the end oh soon. yes I'll just share the screen quickly so that you can have a look. This image, unfortunately, I uh, can't um, share it with you any other way except via screen because it's copyrighted. Um, it's not open example of open sharing, uh, but it's an excellent one for, um, for, dis for understanding how we build and develop and scaffold in our learning. And it, this one's aimed at students and, and children, but I think it's the same thing with MOOCs and open learning. It's certainly wouldn't take uh, a, a child down to the deep end and drop them in or ask them to jump off the diving board if they didn't ever learn how to swim. Um, and, and yet for some reason we think that a MOOC, just because we can uh, Google or just because someone can get onto Facebook, that they, that they should be able to understand and follow a MOOC. There's so many uh, things that underpin it that we do need a courses like ONL that structure and scaffold and provide support and a supportive uh, environment to slowly build from structured, controlled, guided to then free interaction. And I think that, that um, that's what, something that's missing, um, missing when, we, um, when we just jump in at the deep end with a MOOC and expect it to just somehow make sense.
Okay. Okay. This was a little experiment uh, using uh, this platform for a webinar. Um, I find uh, with Adobe Connect we can do an awful lot more things and it can be much more engaging because we have more windows to play with. Uh, we'll think about this. <laughs> it's my fault. We needed Zoom so that we could zoom in from Australia. Adobe doesn't work when uh, every time I've tried it, just the sound drops out and there's terrible screeching noises and screens freeze and people stop yep, moving. Yep. Uh, so it's all my fault. Blame me. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. Not at all. I think we need, we, we need to work more with this uh, and see what we can do. One wonderful thing is we have South Africa and Australia and, and other places loud and clear. It's much, much better for that. Yes. It's, and it's lovely to be able to see faces. When I did manage to get Adobe working, it was usually definitely with the camera off. And it is so much nicer as we were discussing the body language, the smiles, the nods, they're very much appreciated. So what you can do is go back to the Padlet page. We might add some things. We'll put the link to the recording on the Padlet page as well. Uh, so it'll be in different places. Uh, it'll be in the course overview page as well, probably tomorrow. Um, I'll but save a copy of the chat as well as a document and I'll yep. post that up on the Padlet as well. Um, it will be separate, but it will be there for you. So any links that were shared will be accessible then as well. And I think uh, we continue the discussion in the Padlet. Next week, we'll have a tweet chat next Thursday. So uh, don't miss that. Hiking. Ready to go on the yep. tweet chat. Lovely to meet you all. Thank you so much for attending. We're recording off now.